that was lovely. We're so grateful for your contributions to our music and, and, uh, and more today in the service. Uh, Sarah is on um, vacation this week, and so we're, we're grateful for Maria stepping in. Good morning. I am Pastor Bill Fold. It's a great joy to welcome you to this celebration as we grow in God's grace and to welcome you who are watching this on the live stream or at a later time. I have uh, a few announcements I want to bring to your attention. Uh, following this worship service today, we will have our new members uh, exploration class. So if you are wondering what it means to be a United Methodist or whether Jesse Lee might be a good place for you to be a part, no strings attached, but I invite you to join me in the carriage house and we'll talk a little bit about uh, those adventures. Um, tomorrow evening after the eclipse, not that these are related, our bishop will be on the district. Uh, bishop Thomas Bickerton has served as the president of the Global United Methodist Church Bishop Council for the last two years, and he'll be in Shrub Oak, and it's very, uh, it'll be uh, certainly very informative to have him come, and also an encouragement to him to have folks from the churches to come. So tomorrow evening, if you can be present, that would be a real blessing to you and to our, our bishop. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite um, Thomas to make us uh, share with us an announcement. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see all of you today. I have an announcement this morning, which uh, for me is bittersweet. Uh, earlier this week, our district superintendent, the Reverend Ink Hu Chung, uh, invited me to accept a new appointment for the 2024-2025 year. Uh, this invitation was affirmed at a meeting of introduction uh, this past Friday evening, uh, which means that effective July 1st of this year, I will be starting as the pastor of Yorktown United Methodist Church in Yorktown Heights, New York. The, the bitterness of the bittersweetness um, of this announcement for me comes, of course, from a sadness at having to leave. Jesse Lee Church has been a home and a place of growth and delight for me for three, nearly three years now. And insofar as the bishop and the district superintendent um, are confident in my abilities enough to vest me with this charge, insofar as their confidence is well-founded, it is founded in you, in the ways in which you have taught me, allowed me to be in ministry with you, allowed me to make reams and reams of mistakes, and borne that graciously. And so rest assured that I will take you with me um, wherever I go, in a sense. But I am looking forward to the next three months um, as, as I prepare for this new season and this new chapter. Um, I want you to know that I, I do not leave lightly and that the fullness that is in my heart now and the delight that I have for what will come next belongs in many ways to all of you. So thank you. We are so grateful, uh, Thomas, for your ministry in our midst and, and looking forward to the next three months of, of transitions and, and prayer and celebration of you as well. Uh, and, and in some capacity, that also begins next Sunday, uh, April the 14th. We're having a lunch at the Stevens Memorial United Methodist Church campus to talk about our ministry and how that may connect with the campus there, but in a broader arena, how it is that we receive Pastor Thomas's gifts and think about what the Lord has for us next. So please come and sign up and, um, and be a part of that, that discussion. And I also want to point out that there will be a, a contemporary worship service at Stevens on the 28th of April also. Uh, with that, I'm, I'm very blessed to invite Darla Shaw to come and share with us. Uh, March is Women's um, History Month, but because of Lent and some other things, we didn't really think we could give the fullness to that attention that we, what we wanted to. And so uh, Darla is going to share with us each Sunday uh, in April. And so thank you, Darla, for your, your sharing. Good morning, everyone. 
Good morning. We are celebrating Women's History Month in April instead of March because Easter came so early. Well, I have talked in the past about Methodist women who were missionaries and who were preachers. And this month, I'm talking about Methodist women who were educators. I'm going to focus on Frances Willard. I don't know if you remember her from your textbooks. She was head of the Women's Temperance Union. She was not Carrie Nation. She did not carry a hatchet into the bars. She was a true reformer. She was a suffragette. She was an abolitionist. She believed in the best for everyone. She was born in 1839 in Churchville, New Jersey. Her father was a minister, a Methodist minister. Her mother was one of the first women to graduate from Oberlin. She homeschooled her daughter. Her daughter went to the Methodist Women's College of Evanston, Illinois. She graduated number one in her class. She went on to become a school teacher. Then the, her school merged with Northwestern and she became the first woman dean of Northwestern University, a real feather in her cap. Oh, her life was tough. Her mother and sister died very early. Her brother was an alcoholic. She felt that if there was less alcohol, there would be less people in homes for the poor, mental institution, and prisons. She believed so and spoke for women. Equality in jobs, equality in pay, women's shelters, divorce laws, children's work laws. She was such a powerful woman. Well, at the age of 53, she decided she was going to learn to ride a bicycle. She loved it so much that whenever she went to a protest or a lecture that was local, she rode her bicycle. And she was known as the woman reformist on a bicycle. In her 50s, she was elected one of the first five women to the Methodist General Conference. She was also the very first woman to become president of the National Women's Congress. Today, I want you to remember Frances Willard, a great Methodist woman reformer. Thank you. My last announcement, I hope that he would be here today, but Lauren Soltowski has served as our associate sexton for a number of years, and Lawrence um, has a new job as uh, on part, part of the, the care keeping staff at, uh, at Abbott Tech. And so we wish him well, and if you get an opportunity to see him wandering around sometime today, I hope you will as well. And with that, uh, I'll invite the children to come forward for the children's conversation. Are you ready? Not quite. Still coming up. All right, we'll wait for you. Come on up. I'm going to be tricky today. You ready? I think you can handle it. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Happy Easter, boys and girls. Happy Easter, Pastor Bobo. Excellent. Why did I say Happy Easter? 
Well, last Sunday was Easter, but it's still Easter. Jesus is still risen from the dead. It's, it's Easter actually every day. That's right. But it's not Easter Sunday anymore, but I thought I would point that out. So, so I got a parable box here. Is there something in here? Yeah. yeah. Who put something in here today? Did you put something in here? Would you open it up for us? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so we have something here that's it's a parable. It's something that tells us about God, or something God wants us to know, because everything is a parable. What is this? A puppet. A puppet. A puppy dog puppet. That's a lot of pup sounds. So we have to figure out what this tells us about God, or something God wants us to know. Does this does this does this puppet have a name? No, it doesn't have a name. So we, we maybe we could give it a name, or you could give it a name. But so, what do you what do you think this tells us about God? Is something God wants us to know? What do you think? So, so they have a puppy dog. Is it is it fun? Yeah. Okay, a sheep dog. All right. Well, how many of you like dogs? Yeah. You like cats better. So we can like dogs or cats. There's some variety there. But I like dogs too. So what do you think this puppy puppet tells us about God or what something God wants to know? Anybody have any ideas? Well, I'm going to try an experiment. How, how do puppets work? Yes. You forgot what he was going to say? How do puppets work? I know. You know? What do you do? Okay, so let me try and see if I can do that. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah. It works? Good looking group. So, what do you think this puppet might like to talk about? So, so, so the puppet could tell us that we can be happy to have pets and that pets can be with us and make our lives better, right? That's a good thing. Yeah, I like that a lot. Well, one of the things I think is, does this puppet get to say anything all by itself? No. If I say, hello, puppet, and it says, hello, Pastor Bell, it says, hello, Pastor Bell, because I said, hello, Pastor Bell, and I move my fingers inside, right? Yeah. Are you guys puppets? You are your puppet, so if I said, hello, it would be actually me talking and not you. I'm pretty clear that you sometimes say things that other people are surprised at. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're... Well, you know what? Puppets, puppets are not things that get to kind of make their own choices, but do you get to make your cho some choices for you? Yeah. And so God has given us choices. We get to decide sometimes things that, not everything, but some things are choices we get to make. Yeah, you have something you want to share there too? Yeah, puppets inspire our imagination. And we get to kind of pretend things, some things that, are, that we can kind of try out, right? One of the things I like about puppets is sometimes I'm afraid to say something. But it's easy for me to make the puppet say something. Like sometimes it might not feel good for me to say, I'm really angry. But if I can have the puppet go, I'm really angry, I feel a little bit better. Yeah. God finds ways to help us express things that are important to us. So I'm so glad that you've shared this puppet with us. And I'm ready to say a prayer. But before I do, I want you to know that next week... We're going to have a different order in our worship. And you guys are going to, have to be here a little bit longer at the beginning so that you get to sing some songs and do some things here before you go to Sunday school. And I'm really excited about that because we like having you around. Uh, you won't have less time for Sunday school. We, we're going to.
Yeah. I'm so excited you're excited about that and, and recognizing you might miss some things we're not going to have that happen. I'm ready to pray. Who's ready to pray with me? You are. Let's fold our hands. Here we go. Dear God, we thank you for puppets and imagination and good stories. And we thank you that we are not puppets, that you give us choices. Help us to choose to love like you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for coming up. We're going to sing Jesus Loves Me, and thanks for sharing that with us. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to celebration. The disciples gathered in fear after the crucifixion. While they were together, the, the, the disciples saw the risen Lord. The disciples' fear turned to joy when he appeared to them. Please join us in singing hymn number 327, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Please be seated. 
As we continue in worship this morning, I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. Would you pray with me? Immortal, invisible God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you became visible to the naked eye, allowing a few to see you as clear as anything so that a great many more might look for you in the crowded, murky depths of everything. As we gather in this place to worship you this day, we ask that you would be in our eyes and in our looking, as well as in those places where our vision fails us. Remind us, we who strain to take it all in, that the eye is not the only or even the best way of seeing. Teach us, we who guard against nakedness of the eye or of anything else, to keep our hearts peeled for you. Show us what it is to look for you and at last to see you. Receive this prayer which we offer in Christ's name. Amen. Confession is an opportunity for us to acknowledge places where we hurt, hurt ourselves, hurt others, and to seek a new beginning. Restitution, perhaps. Forgiveness, certainly. I invite you now to join with me in the prayer of confession, which is printed in your bulletin. You are a God who finds us even when we withdraw. We cannot hide from you. You know our fears, our hesitations, our failures, and our doubts. Yet you seek us in mercy and appear to us in grace. When we meet the risen Christ, we are transformed. Make us into new people who may live toward the future instead of being defined by the past. Amen. In the silence of these moments, let us lift before God our personal confession. Hear now the good news. God is for us. Who then can be against us? Shall anything separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? No, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so it is my joy to announce that your confession is heard, that in the name of Jesus Christ our sin is forgiven. Thanks be to God for this great mercy. And now let us join together praying as our Lord has taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to remain seated and join in our hymn of reflection, number 368 in your hymnal, My Hope is Built.
Today's scripture reading is from John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of, of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Christ is risen. And that good news is certainly a proclamation of who Jesus is and the power of his life. But it's more than that. Resurrection is the promise of all of us, for all of us. And we celebrate that even in the midst of tears. Uh, this coming Saturday, we will celebrate the resurrection and the life of Dan Winward at 11 o'clock in this sanctuary. Because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, and that promise extends far and wide. So I invite you to come and be a part of that remembrance. Will you please pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, and give to me the gift of preaching, that the words spoken here would be your word. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill all of our hearts that we may recognize your voice and follow on the path that you have set for us. In the name of Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. It's Resurrection Day in the evening. It's Resurrection Day, and the disciples of Jesus have received reports from the women. Peter and John have been to the tomb and found nothing and seen no one. And we are not sure where the disciples are what location they are in. The text proclaims that they are afraid of the Jews, which really means the Judean religious authorities. And perhaps they are afraid of Judas. If he has led some kind of a plot to get them also. Feeling like victims, they hide, except for Thomas, who is out. I'm not just saying this because Reverend Stubbs is here, but I, I think sometimes Thomas gets a, a bad rap. And I'll say more about that a little bit later in the sermon, but, you know, Thomas could have been out attending to necessities. Even in the midst of grief and fear, you still got to eat. If you're trying to figure out how to get out of the city safely, it might be good to know if there are people watching the gates to find out what's going on. I don't know why Thomas is not there, but he's not. There is much to be distressed about in their world. Laws and rules have been broken. Betrayal and manipulation and deception from leaders, both religious and governmental, would be enough to make anyone feel insecure. And I wonder what Jesus' disciples might be concerned about. Certainly the things I just made reference to that Thomas might be checking out, but it could be more personal security. 
What happens to my property? Will someone come and seize it? Or my family? Will someone use them to get to me? Maybe they're also concerned about some personal failures. Perhaps they're reflecting out loud, maybe in the midst of tears. Maybe, maybe we could have talk him, talked him out of coming to Jerusalem. Perhaps we should have fought for him in the garden, harder. Maybe I should have stayed in Galilee and fished. Who did I think I was anyway? And now there's Mary Magdalene proclaiming that Jesus is alive. Is that good news? What will be the consequences of that? Perhaps they're saying, you know, the authorities might be cooling off after the execution of Jesus, but such rumors like he is risen might get them again looking for us. And more blood. It's a lot. Peace be with you. Not just another way to say hello. Jesus stands in their midst, the Prince of Peace, the risen Savior, the Lamb of God, who took away the sins of the world, the one who opens shut doors or ignores them. He says, peace. And the text does not give any indication that the disciples at that moment are overjoyed to see him. It is not until he shows them his hands and his side, his wounds, that they rejoice. I can't speak for you, but I know that I'm not anxious to share my wounds. I, I keep those places in my life where my, my misjudgments or the things that have happened to me that maybe I don't think I had any responsibility for, but still, they hurt. I try and keep them kind of behind locked doors. And it's interesting that it is precisely because Jesus says, look how I got hurt, that the disciples are freed to believe that there might be something more than hurt. And they receive joy. He says, peace, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. What does that mean? What does it mean as they reflect upon what Jesus was sent to do? Is that good news? It comes with power from the Holy Spirit and the power to forgive sins, but up until recently that had not occurred to them that that would be something they needed in their lives. Clean the nets, pick up a new cloak, fix Jacob's sandal, and now, oh yeah, don't forget, heal the sick and forgive sins. Pretty cool. But they could have imagined a life without the Holy Spirit, without being a spiritual peacemaker. And so Jesus has given them peace and power and an assignment to go as Jesus had gone in the power of the Spirit with the ability to forgive sins. And what do they do? Well, the text tells us a week later, they're in the same place they were before, having done nothing different than what they did before. Doors are still locked, only this time Thomas is there. Jesus appears, peace be with you. And then he talks to Thomas, but I don't think he's just talking to Thomas. Since those who were given power and sent in some capacity haven't done anything. Sometimes I need to overhear messages because if they come directly at me, I'm defensive. Have you noticed that? That that sometimes happens to us if somebody says, hey, we go, oh. But if they're looking at somebody else and saying, huh, we go, huh. And so he looks at Thomas and he says, you wanted to check me out, here I am. And Thomas 
Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Powerful, important words. And Jesus says, do you believe because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and come to believe. Blessed, happy. Happy are those who have a, a faith that there is more, that there are possibilities and pathways that didn't seem obvious at first. What does it mean to have faith? Well, we might talk about that as giving assent to some variety of belief. I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that he rose from the dead. Does that impact the way that I interact in my world? A surgeon who has good knowledge she has been to school, she has studied the textbook, she has seen operations. But if she does not practice the surgery with any regularity, do you want her having your life in her hands? Faith, belief, means living as if it is so. That's what it literally means to engage in the world with an expectation that these are the realities. I can exercise gifts and study in this surgical procedure that might bring an opportunity for healing for this person. And I need to practice that. Was that true in our spiritual lives as well? Peace and power are gifts from God. Are we willing to receive them, to be changed by them, to be directed in a way that allows us, in some capacity, to grow? After the experience in that room again with Thomas present, what changes for the disciples? Well, the scripture lesson for next week in the lectionary is not one that you're going to get. Sorry, you can read ahead. I have other agendas for the end of our Wicked Truth sermon series. But I will tell you, the disciples go to Galilee, half of them go fishing with Peter. Yeah, they're not behind locked doors, and yeah, they're behind locked doors. It takes time. In our, in our Methodist pathway, we have the three B's and they go in a particular order. I don't really agree with that, I'm just telling you. But the three B's are, you believe to belong to behave. When I believe that Jesus is risen, that the power of love triumphs, and I connect with a family, a group of faith who encourage that, then my capacities to live out that faith, to practice it, are enhanced. You believe to belong to behave. Does that sound good? Yeah, but sometimes we need to behave before we feel comfortable belonging. And sometimes the faith comes after we're in the midst of the activities that allow faith to show up. Sometimes you've got to get out of the boat in order to find out that the water isn't what you thought it was. Faith and practice under stress is a pathway to abundant life. It isn't what I'm looking for often. Sometimes I want to keep my wounds hidden, but it is a pathway. When I see that God does things through me and in me, I can say, hallelujah, Christ is risen. And if I say, ooh, I have failed so many times, maybe somebody else, what did Jesus say to, to this group of folks who are slow to learn and struggle? Peace be with you. You have the power to forgive. Sometimes that might mean us first. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. We get to overhear that message. And blessed are we if we come to believe 
That's Almighty God, you have loved us with an everlasting love, and you have sent us forth with capacities that are not always obvious to us. We need to walk with you and trust you. Grant us, Lord, the courage to walk with you and trust you and to practice the faith that is your faith. Amen. At this time in our service, we are blessed to be a blessing, and I invite our ushers to receive our morning offering. I invite those of you online or here to also make use of our other means of, of supporting the church and its ministries as we receive God's gifted music by Maria.
Almighty God, we give you thanks for all that you have given to us, and we return to you this, the first fruit of our labor, for the extension of your kingdom, your kingdom, that love and light may triumph here and everywhere. Amen. Will you please be seated? My sisters and brothers, this is the table of the Lord. It is set for us not because we are so good. It is set for us not because we have earned it or have made progress or even show potential. It is set for us because God knows we're hungry and God loves you and me and chooses to feed us. So come, not because you must, but because you may not because you are strong, but because you desire God's strength at work in your life. Come because Christ invites you to come. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, from the foundation of the world, you have been sending forth your witnesses that your children might discern what is true and right and good, that we might turn away from those pathways which hurt us and others through prophets and priests, friends and family, even sometimes adversaries. In the fullness of time, you yourself came. Your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, showed us what life is. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He loved those who had been told that they were unlovable. He brought hope to those in the midst of despair. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he separated the bread and the cup to be a living memorial. And we ask, Lord, that you would pour your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and unfermented wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we may become the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood for the world. Make us one with each other and one in ministry until Christ comes again and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. On that night and at that table, Jesus took the bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. It is broken for you. Take and eat and remember. Later that same night, after the supper was over, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. It is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink it, do so remembering me. And so, my siblings in Christ, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In a few moments, our communion assistants will come and we will have three stations up front. The front two will be gluten-full bread and the one in the middle will have gluten-free option. You're invited to come and to receive a piece of bread and to dip it into the chalice and consume the elements together by means of intinction. Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feasts.
I will invite you to take a little risk and reach out and take the hand of somebody that's close to you. If you're not close to anybody, um, you can hold your hands up and we'll make that kind of the cosmic connection. Gospel of the world that God gave the only begotten Son. Jesus our Lord so loved us that he gave us each other. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks for this heavenly mystery in which you have given yourself for us. You have fed us with spiritual food. You have loved us with an everlasting love. And you have promised us your peace and your presence. And we pray, Lord, for the courage to believe you, to go because you send us, to trust that what you give will be enough, particularly as you are at work in our midst. Remind us, Lord, that we cannot ask or imagine all the good that you will bring about, even in the midst of circumstances and situations from which we wish to hide. Help us, Lord, to believe, to know that we belong, and in your grace that our behavior may begin to reflect you in fuller ways. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray it. Amen. Would you, pre would you please pray with me? Oh God, we often do not know how to pray as we ought, and yet we practice all the same, trusting and believing that to reach out to you in prayer on behalf of ourselves and on behalf of others is one of those pathways into a deeper relationship with you. And so, we pray this day for all of those whom we wish you to show yourself to, and for all of those who, in some way, concrete or ineffable, have seen you. We pray for the needs and concerns of this community that you would pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, bring comfort, consolation, healing, and reconciliation, so that, having been given each other by your Son, Jesus Christ, we might give ourselves to one another as well. Help us, O oh God, to live for each other, first in this way, by remembering each other and help us to be Christ's to one another in this way, too. We pray, O oh God, for the concerns of our town, our state, our nation, and the world, and particularly for those suffering in Gaza, in Israel, in Ukraine, 
in Russia, in all those places where violence has rent asunder even the most flawed of relationships, all of those places where disconnection, loneliness, violence, and death have become the rule. We pray, O oh Lord, for those places and pray that you would break that rule, that by your grace, the world and the people in it, including us, would move toward one another and in charity rather than malice. We pray, O oh God, particularly for leaders, those appointed and those who are leaders because that is where they have landed. All of those, O oh Lord, who have power and influence over others, we pray that you would bend their hearts in particular toward a longing for peace and a longing for justice, a longing to see your will done not only through and with them, but through and with those whom they lead and serve as well. Finally, O oh Lord, we pray that in your name we would go forth from this place as ambassadors of this great love, of this vision of your kingdom in which we are enough and in which others are enough too. Help us, O oh Lord, to give and to receive. Bind us closer to one another and closer at last to you. All of this we are bold to pray in Christ's name. Amen. You're now invited to join, to stand as you are able and join in singing our closing hymn, number 295 in your hymnal, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Let us sing together. And now, may the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ be your faith, that you may walk in confidence 
that you may love with boldness, that you may live with an eye toward expectation, that all things, all things are redeemed by God in God's time. Go now in the peace of Christ to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Let us offer to one another a sign of the peace of Christ.